Okay, so it's a pleasure to have uh, Matteo E. Politi uh, visiting us from uh, now UT Austin. So Matteo uh, did his PhD working on strongly correlated electron systems, quantum dynamics um, uh, from Princeton, working with Robin Putt. Uh, then he, uh, since then in 2019, uh, he, he joined the, as a postdoctoral scholar at, at Stanford, working with Bedeka Kemani. And uh, he's really been since doing some absolutely fantastic work on um, all aspects of quantum dynamics, including deep thermalization, which is like thermalization as you understand it, but leveled up um, uh, on uh, on sort of uh, you know these measurement induced phase transitions, which I guess he's going to tell us a little more about, and quantum state tomography. Uh, particularly classical shadows, which is this new framework for um, trying to get out information from a state without doing too, too many measurements of it. Uh, so without further ado, Taylor. Thank you so much. Thank you, Patrick. Um, yeah, it's great to be here. Uh, first time in first time at McGill, uh, and uh, first time in Montreal in a long time, so really enjoyed me. Good idea. Uh, thank you for coming. So I'm going to tell you about um, this recent work that um, basically the last work of our postdoc with David Ackerman at Stanford. Um, uh, the reference is here. I will also point out another very nice work that came out uh, roughly simultaneously from each of you San Diego that uh, takes a lot of similar problem. Well, um, the same problem comes to us. The um, topic is learnability phase transitions in monitor quantum dynamics. So there are a few terms here to define, but that over the first part of the talk. Okay, but let me start from the very beginning. Okay. So in quantum mechanics, you know, when we first opened the textbook, we learned that quantum states evolve in time according to Schrodinger's equation, which is written here, and it has many nice properties. For example, it is linear in the wave function. Uh, it is smooth in time, the state changes very gradually, and it is deterministic. So in principle, if we know everything, we can just solve it for find the future, and we will know the state of our system. Unfortunately, when we turn the page and we want to run next topic, we find out that this doesn't always work. There is a whole other set of laws in quantum mechanics that describe what happens when you measure a quantum system, and they are very different. They are, for one, uh, non-deterministic, they're, they're stochastic, you, get a, and you can predict probabilities for measurement outcomes, but the outcome is ultimately random. The process is continuous, so there is a before state and an after state, and they are quite different, general. And it is also non linear. We have to formalize our post measurement state in this way. So, all of these nice properties kind of go out the window, and then it's this rich set of rules that don't often come into play in condensed matter physics because, you know, by and large, I think most or all of condensed matter physics takes place within the rules of Schrodinger's equation. We're thinking of Hamiltonian dynamics, you know, quench dynamics, or we're thinking of Hamiltonian ground states or equilibrium states. We're firmly in that first set of rules, and measurement is only something that tells us about what is happening here. Doesn't directly come into play in action, it only tells us about it. However, this is set to change to some extent with the development of new technologies uh, for quantum computing and quantum simulation that we can think of as synthetic quantum matter. So, you know, quantum matter that is not occurring in nature and kind of naturally, but is engineered and is made to have certain properties. And this takes many shapes and forms, and it's not an exhaustive space by any means, but it can be. Uh, processors like qubits or trapped ions. It can be analog simulators based on optically trapped atoms uh, and you know, many more things. What these things have in common is that they offer uh, very advanced capabilities for the control of dynamics. So this means both unitary dynamics, time-dependent Hamiltonians, for example, but also the ability to measure in a very microscopic, resolved way the state of these quantum body systems. And this opens up interesting opportunities for types of physics where measurement takes a more central active role as opposed to just telling us what's going on. And I think in particular, this opens up opportunities for, for non equilibrium physics, for physics of many body systems that, are, that is far from equilibrium. Um, and let me unpack this statement a little bit why I'm saying that. So these systems are being built as quantum computers or simulators, right? So at the end of the day, we would like to use them for, for, for computation. And computation is a very, you know, it's an inherently auto-equilibrium process. In particular, in the circuit model of quantum computation, which is the more mainstream one, 
We're thinking of uh, an array of, of qubits that are spin half particles, we have two level systems, zero, one. That I'm sketching here as vertical lines. This is a diagram where uh, time is flowing from bottom to top. The, the vertical lines are states of our uh, two level systems. And these blue boxes are so called unitary gates. They are Hamiltonian interactions on two, two uh, spin half particles lacking for some time, and uh, they, they couple these subsystems, these particles. And if I stagger them in this way, I will, you know, after some time, create a, a complex many body state on, on all of the particles, right, with a lot of correlations and entanglement and so on. This is a model of quantum computation because I can put logical instructions in here and produce a quantum state that, that has the answer to the question. Okay. Uh, but at the physics level, this is a complicated time dependent Hamilton. And all of these systems have to be able to just do these things, right? So it's very advanced ability for, for drive. At the same time, the drive isn't necessarily perfect. It will have errors, it's perfections. You can think of these as kind of discrete processes that perturb your system at particular positions and times. But also couplings to, to an outside environment, for example, a thermal bath that disturb your, your evolution. Uh, and we would like to, um, you know, if we run a computation, we eventually want to get an answer out of it. So we need to be able to read it out. And this means measuring not just the typical coarse grain properties that we usually think about in condensed matter, like connectivity, you know, something, one number that tells you about the whole system, but really um, microscopically resolved measurements of all of the. Elementary constituents of the system I'm sketching here because if there's the quantum measurements. And that's for readout, for finding the final answer to your computation, but also eventually if we want to do error corrected computation, which we hopefully eventually will, will get to technologically, we must also be able to make these measurements not just at the end, but also over the course of the dynamics. So as we go, we would like to make some measurements that tell us whether an error has happened or not. And after doing that, you're not just happy to, to know whether it has happened. You want to be able to also correct that in principle. So we should be able to take this information, process it in some way to some classical company within, and decide, for example, on current beam operations. So feed that information forward into the system and control the following iterations. So this is a very, you know, um, lots of lots of ingredients coming right here, and these are all motivated by quantum computing. But I want to think of these as really uh, knobs that you can use to control a quantum many-body system in the same way that you might control a, you know, a, a sample of some material system, but with all of these different now, different and more, um, more sophisticated sort of uh, capabilities for microscopic control. <laughs> so what I want to ask in particular is, given that we have all of these at least in principle, right? I think the reality is more complicated, but given that we have all of these possibilities, what can we do with them? And in particular, from a condensed matter point of view, what universal phenomena could we uh, investigate in this domain? Okay. So that is just the level of general motivation of why, you know, the, the kind of question that we like to think about. But in, in this talk, we'll focus on much smaller subset of, of, of these possibilities. Uh, and we'll I'll introduce two things that fall within this general framework. One is monitor dynamics, which is quantum dynamics that features measurement over the course of the entire many-body evolution, as, as we've seen. And this has emerged as, as a, a new arena for having universal behavior in quantum many-body systems away from equilibrium, which is where we typically think of on either side. And secondly, I'll introduce classical shadows, which are this framework for efficiently learning properties of of quantum many body states uh, from a relatively limited number of measurements. These are both kind of interesting developments that have happened in uh, quantum, uh, quantum information and quantum uh, uh, condensed matter over the last few years. But uh, the, the point of this talk is to bring them together and um, use these to uncover some new universal phenomenon that I'm going to uh, discuss as a phase transition in third activity from monitor dynamics. So that's what the Okay. Um, all right, so let me start by introducing monitor quantum dynamics. Okay, so the idea uh, is just to bring in one of those ingredients that I that flashed earlier, which is measurement over the course of the evolution. So again, we have in mind something like this, which is a quantum circuit with an array of qubits um, evolving over time with some unitary evolution 
which you can think of as a kind of headband part of Newtonian, uh, interspersed with measurements everywhere in the system and randomly in time. So as we go, we have some uh, rate or probability of performing a measurement on, on any given uh, particle uh, at most of time. And this is an interesting problem because um, unitary evolution left to, to its own uh, devices would, would you know, tend to bring systems to thermal equilibrium, tends to increase entropy. And uh, the only fixed point of that is uh, some maximum entropy state, which is just a statement of thermalization to achieve equilibrium at late times. But measurements get in the way of that because they repeatedly uh, reset the use of freedom to some state, but state consistent with the outcome of any given measurement. And as we saw at the beginning, this quantum wave function collapse process has some striking features. It's random, it's, it's, it's continuous, and it can have global, you know, non-local effects on the many body state. So we're constantly going in and preventing this state from equilibrium. So if it itself never reaches a steady state, it keeps kind of bouncing between different corners of hyperspace, but what was uncovered, uh, raised a lot of interest, is that the ensemble of states can achieve universal forms at big times. So there is this phase transition in the structure of quantum information, this ensemble of states, that we can, um, you know, showing a schematic, uh, schematic diagram here, uh, we can think of it as a phase transition between a, a, a so-called entangling phase and the disentangling phase as a function of the rate at which we are measuring the system. So if we measure very frequently, we successfully disentangle the system, and if we measure below some threshold, then entanglement can remain in these states of the times. So let me say a bit more about how to think about this phenomenon beyond the kind of definition. The idea is that this dynamics, again, sketching as a, as a circuit with initial state, some dynamics, some final state, this describes or generates a network or a web of quantum information in space and time. Um, meaning that there are correlations. If, if you take a subsystem somewhere, you take a different subsystem potentially at a different time and different position, they may or may not share correlations and information. And this, this whole set of correlations is described by this network of information that may or may not be connected. In the sense that as we go in and make more and more measurements, well, these are, in a sense, um, severing connections in this network. They're isolating different parts of the, you know, that they're separating the past and the future, for example, uh, at a given position, and making more, uh, you know, Overcoming some threshold in these of measurements can completely disconnect this network. And, uh, and, and it can give you this phase transition, for example. So this is the first kind of manifestation of the phase transition that was discovered in 2018. It is between, you know, if you take the final stage and you ask about information share between two subsystems that are, for example, two halves of the, of the one dimensional state chain. Um, then you can have a disentangling phase where entanglement plays an area loss, so it's only proportional to the size of the boundary, which is constant in one dimension, to a phase of the basal volume law where there is, in fact, extensive entanglement between these two subsystems. But this same picture for this uh, network of information also applies to not just spatially separated uh, subsystems, but also temporally separated. So if I ask about information that is shared from the initial state, so, so A is the bottom here is the initial state, and this uh, subsystem B, which is the final state, uh, I can still feel the effects of this network of information being connected or disconnected. But not the fast as basically persistence or, or loss of knowledge about the initial conditions. Transition with the memory of the initial state. And this, in this paper here by Ethan Hughes, has been uh, called a, a, a dynamical purification phase transition. We can think of this as if I send in here a, a completely mixed quantum state, so an equal superposition of all states in the hyperspace, so you can think of it as an infinite temperature uh, equilibrium state. At late times, as I keep going, I make measurements, I can lose entropy, I can make my state more pure as I go. So each one of these measurements purifies one of the qubits principle. And so at later times, I might have a pure state, even though I start with a mixed state. And this phase transition separates a phase where this happens quickly and quickly converts to a pure state from a phase where instead I maintain some non-trivial 
um, mixed state for for many times. Okay, so that's why. And this is a point of view that we are mainly going to take. So I want to flash it here. Um, but this physics is quite distinctive from most other phenomena that you know I think people mostly think about when it matter because or in physics at large is because um, a very important aspect of science and physics is we have to be able to reproduce a phenomenon to make it once, measure it, but then we have to be able to make it again and measure it again. And it has to be the same, otherwise we don't have a reproducible phenomenon. Yes, but there maybe I can ask a question. Yes. Go back to the last yes. so. I understand this as like, okay, you start with a fully mixed state, then you ask what's the entropy of what's coming out. Mm -hmm. um, but the initial state is like the state with basically no real information. It's like, so, so how do I think of this instead as also a, a transition where information is being lost? Right, that is a great, great question. Uh, uh, yes, okay. so you can think of this as a placeholder. This is like a, this is like a blank, uh -huh. sheet of paper, you could write anything on it. So this is like, you could pick and choose any one of the states in the mixture and send it in. And if the state becomes pure, it means that this message, you were free to choose, gets overwritten by some garbage. Uh -huh. This quantum state sign the output is pure, so it doesn't have any freedom anymore. Uh -huh. We're free to send in a different input, but you get the same output. Uh -huh. So that information is lost. But as here, yes, maybe the entropy is lower, so you have lost some information, but some of the stuff you sent in can be reflected in this conjugal subspace that is, that is left. See, right. Okay. So somehow you can make this like a connection that suppose I actually, yeah, I guess it, it follows from viewing this instead as um, uh, an entropy transition, entanglement entropy transition, where uh, suppose you start A in some particular initial state, and then, and then you look at what comes out and whether it's uh, it's some mixed yeah, somehow it has information about uh, initial state. Okay, I, I think we can discuss this. Okay. Uh, to give you to your point, if you had a unitary operation here, mm -hmm. then this would surely remain in right. mixed. Right. And that is just a statement that unitarity is reversible, right? Right. Don't do that right. So right. Basically, okay. how far are you deviating from mm -hmm. the evolution? That's right. right. That's a very good point. So I would say, uh, you know, this phenomenon is distinctive because um, it is very, very hard to make the same experiment twice. In other words, um, as, we, as we go, we are making measurements, and each measurement can have multiple outcomes. Let's say two outcomes, we're just measuring the two component of state, so up or down. Well, this defines two possible wave functions that I can get after the measurement, called psi zero and psi one. And then these other goes on more dynamics, but then we make another measurement. And then the wave functions further split into two, and as we keep going, we'll get a branching tree of possible histories for our system. And you know, each endpoint of this tree is some wave function, for example, this line has some history of all the measurement outcomes, especially. And these are all very different many body wave functions. Because as we get different outcomes, not only that particular spin is you know point in different directions, but also the rest of the global wave function has collapsed in some potentially complicated non-global way. So these are really different wave functions. And um, to get the same one twice is very, very hard because there are exponentially many. Branches on this tree, and to try twice, that's very likely end up on a different function. What is further um, frustrating about this is that the physics we care about, this phase transition and entanglement, is absolutely not visible in the you know in the stochastic mixture of these trajectories. So if we just repeat an experiment many times without regard for what we got, uh, which you know which branch we, we we traverse, and we just Measure not unobservable and then and collect all the data and average it, we will effectively be um, probing this stochastic mixture, so some way uh, times the projector of that particular trajectory. And this is a trivial state. This is essentially an equilibrium density matrix, um, you know, genetic and infinite temperature that doesn't really know anything about the space transition, doesn't change in any particular way as we sweep the, the measurement way, for instance. So the phase transition will be visible in quantities like the entropy of some particular wave function, which is nonlinear. So due to it being nonlinear, even if I average, I do not fall back on this simple state. I can get some logical information. But maybe this requires that we prepare multiple times the same, uh, the same kind of branch of this tree, which is exponentially unlikely. So this seems like 
uh, insurmountable difficulty. And I think he did 30 papers on this phenomenon in 2018 or so. This was actually uh, flagged as a, as a really, um, as making this not so much a physical phenomenon, but more of an idea, you know, something you might exploit in computation, but not really something of measurement. So this was considered maybe not so um, really, really observable for a long time. Uh, and the output changed a bit over the years, uh, particularly this paper and others that then followed. But we take a different point of view of uh, what I'm going to call the coding perspective, which is to say, um, if there is information in the system, so if we are in this phase that, that, that retains some knowledge about the initial state, then this information has to be somewhere in the system, organized in some degrees of freedom. We should be able to, given knowledge of all of the measurement outcomes, uh, figure out some, some transformation, some change of basis, you know, some community that we can do on the system, condition on the measurement outcomes, to refocus this information somehow in some of the degrees of freedom some predictable way that we can then measure. And then we can find out deterministically every time whether or not this information is in there. So we uh, get rid of this issue with the, the complexity of you know, running the experiment many, many times at the expense of, of doing this class of computation that could be hard. You know, could be an exponentially long computation, but there is a, a separate problem. And um, at least at the level of uh, experiments, this, this solves a major issue. And, um, and also, um, an important point to make is that, as, as we can hear, there's an idealized scenario, we are doing our quantum experiment, you know, comparing a state up to this point. Then we are uh, we're saying, OK, wait a minute, I'm going to go run a very complex classical calculation, take a few days, come back to you. Of course, in the meantime, our quantum processor will have to go here and lost everything. Right? So this is not something necessarily realistic, at least today. Uh, but it, this is not inherently necessary. It's possible to stop the experiment here measure everything on the system, and then do this final part in classical post-processing to some extent. Not, you know, not exactly the same, but, but it's enough to get a signature of the phase transition. And this gives right to something that's been called a, a hybrid or quantum classical open parameter. Various versions of this were presented in various works. And I want to say that this is not just idealized. This can be done. Oh, yeah. uh, is there a conceptual difference between this and quantum error correction? Or is it simply a? In, you know, just a different application. Right, I think. So as you, great point. So the coding perspective is exactly taking this point of view that uh, this is a version of quantum error correction. Um, you can think of um, these different uh, measuring outcomes as a syndrome, and then there is a correcting unit that you can do based on the syndrome. And uh, yes, that is essentially that point of view. There is a bit of a, a difference here that the measurements are both diagnosing you know, playing the role of the syndrome extraction. So, so you know, they're, they're good, but also they are somehow destroying information themselves. They're also the error. They're kind of playing both sides of this game, in a sense. Um, I think this is true in quantum error correction codes, too. I guess there you engineer them in such a way that you don't destroy your logical information, but... but uh, I think inevitably there are measurement errors, so... You have okay, to take good point. Down. Yes. Here, even without measurement errors, the, the, yeah. uh, if you measure above threshold, you're, you're, there is no logical. But yes, you can think of this as a, as a family of random codes. Yeah. And you can, in the phase transition, the properties of those random codes. Yeah. That is a very useful point of view. Okay. Good. So, yeah, we can, um, you know, even if we can't do this quantum feedback, we could, be, could do this classical post processing. And this has been done. This paper, so, you know, let's say, uh, there's been a few experiments about this, this uh, recent one that I collaborated with uh, the Google uh, team on their 70 qubit quantum processor. You know, we're able to see some signatures of this phase transition by using this kind of trick, a quantum classical order parameter, we colored in some situation in the experiment. Um, and um, this and the other experiments were recently uh, discussed in this quantum magazine piece with a slightly, uh, slightly dramatic title. An observable phase transition, but this this reflects the the comment that I made about how this is a somewhat subtle and you know distinctive problem with the randomness of measurement outcomes that needs to be overcome with some 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 more uh, some more thinking. Uh, but okay, so I want to now introduce a different point of view on the same phenomenon, which is in some sense dual. So, in the coding point of view, we're asking: Is there information in the system? So, is it left? 
sort of unmeasured, unobserved in the quantum system and can we take it out if we, if we do some work? Here I want to ask a different question, which is, is there information in the measurement record about our initial state? So I can model this as having an experimentalist Alice who's controlling the quantum system, but then also a second agent, uh, Niels Rocker, that we call Eve in the quantum vision jargon, who's, who's outside and who gets to read these classical measurement outcomes. So she gets to peek at uh, Alice's lab notebook, for example, for measurement outcomes are, are written, but uh, she doesn't get to directly look at the quantum system perception. So this final state that, that is here is inaccessible. You cannot go in and change it or measure it or do anything. You can only get this classical data plus classical knowledge about what's happening. The blueprint for the dynamics, you have that, but you don't have the quantum state itself. The question is, can Eve learn properties of the quantum state? Uh, yes. Sorry, are you starting still with this paradigm of a, a maximally mixed initial state, or you imagine a different type of initial Okay, state? so now we're imagining filling that that uh, placeholder with an actual state row, but that state row is unknown. But it, so it could be pure, or it could be mixed? It could be pure, it could be mixed, okay. yeah. That's right. That's right. We're just asking, like, for example, expectation values of like, observables on that row or, or, or entropies or you know, the usual static yeah. things that one can ask about that kind of thing. And we'll ask questions that are somewhat independent of row, but yes, one should imagine that there's some state there. So, again, the heuristic idea is that if we have information that survives in the system, then it shouldn't leak into the measurement outcomes. And vice versa, if there is no information left in the system, then maybe it has leaked into the measurement outcomes. So there is a sense in which that phase transition in the ability to recover information from this coding point of view should be, should be fit in this learning point of view, and it should be able to learn in the regime where the measurements are very frequent, and it should become less able to learn in the regime where they are sufficiently infrequent. Okay, this is completely non reverse, just like you will see. How, how this works out, but we, it's reason to expect that it might be a phase transition as well. Okay. The question though is how do we quantify learning? How do we make it really precise? And this is where uh, classical shadows come in. It's other development that I ended up at the beginning uh, that come out of the uh, rescue group and, and others uh, in the last uh, few years for uh, learning many properties of quantum states from a relatively limited number of measurements that is you know, strongly dependent on what measurements, what states, and so on. But um, it, it, this is the idea, and it's remarkably successful way it works. The idea is to build a contrast classical description of the state from measurement data and some classical computation. And the philosophy of the method is to measure first and ask questions later. So, we just want to build this description in a somewhat agnostic way, and then later on go in and try to see what we can do. Uh, practically, how this works is we have this quantum state row. We rotate it in some random basis. So this unitary U has to be specified. So this comes from some ensemble that we get to choose. And after this rotation, we go in and we measure all of our qubits in the computational basis, and we get some of these we then feed this data, so both the choice of the basis and the outcome, to a bus simulation, to computation, and this produces this kind of description of the state that we can later on use to try and, and get answers to different questions that we haven't directly asked in this obstruction. Yeah, right. So, part of you that we have a high dimensional object that we are going to see, and this casts a shadow on these lower dimensional planes that are the the measurements we're making, right? So the idea is, can we just learn the shadow of the state instead of the state itself? That's why the words were, that's where this word comes from. Now, a little bit more detail on how this actually works, because it would be useful for our eavesdropper learning problem. Uh, we choose this random rotation and apply to our, to our, to our uh, state and then we measure. And then our task is to essentially guess, you know, formulate a best guess as to what the state might have been given that data. And we can do this in two parts, very straightforwardly. So this stage here, right before measuring, our best guess is simply that the system was in the basis state B that we just measured. We have nothing else to go by, and that's what we just uh, 
right out. So we might as well guess that the system was in a particular basis state at this point. And so then by mapping our guess backwards to the actual basis of the, of the, of the system, our guess becomes this uh, sigma uh, state that is just a backward rotated beta state pattern. Okay. That's our guess uh, on the snapshot state. And um, by itself, it's not a great guess for the true state row. The state row might be full rank, might be whatever, and this is a rank bound project. So it's not you know, necessarily great as a guess. But it has a little, little bit of information about row. And if we average many, many iterations of this process, we will get something that actually knows about row to some extent. So the math goes, you know, Details are so crucial, but the math goes like this. We have some probability of getting you know, our outcome B given, given the basis choice. We have our snapshot here. If we average them, we get something which is a linear function of rho, and it's a state. So this thing here is a one channel as a whole. So it's a map that takes a state, it's not a state. You can think of this as some kind of noise or some kind of corruption of the data. So you don't get exactly the state you want, but you get some. Some noisy version of it. And then again, in classical post processing, you can go in and you can try to undo this damage by applying the M inverse. It's not a physical path you can do, but it's something you can potentially. Um, and then you get these objects, row path that are also known as the vertical snapshots or the classical shadows of true state. And uh, this has the nice property that by construction, from the way you made them, their average is the true state. So take an expectation here, then by linearity the expectation inside, you get an inverse acting on an over row, you get row. That's the other. There's no magic here, this is just the way that each one constructs the same. Um, so okay, we have these estimators for the state, you can use them, you won't use them as properties of the state. And then the whole question is how demanding this is, how many, how many shocks one actually is. But um, let me um, let's see how we can how we might Apply this throughout the program at hand, which is this uh, eavesdropper getting the measurement outcomes and trying to learn properties of them. Can we use that for shadows to formulate this problem and quantify it to learn? And uh, the first thing to note is that there are some modifications that need to be made relative to the standard protocol that I just uh, showed. So, in the standard protocol, we were able to go in at the final state and measure everything so by construction. Uh, that assumes we have control on the system, which is obviously most, most often the case in these situations. But in this, in this compiled example, we don't have that. So uh, we, can't, we can't perform the final measurement. We have to do something else here to stop our uh, get best guess for the state. And then, secondly, this unit exchange of basis we have in the, in the protocol uh, will have to be replaced by something non like that is the dynamic that is composed of both unit evolution and measurements. So kind of matrix that has has both uh, unitary pieces and projectors, so it's some kind of unitary pieces as a whole. Well. Okay. So, and it would, this would can, yeah. So, is it fair to say that um, the standard shadows protocol has uh, random unitaries followed by deterministic measurements? And here you're adding in random measurements in addition to some random unitaries? Yes, I think that's, 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 that's part of it. The other part is that we don't have the final deterministic measurements, we're just yeah, replacing that by those random ones. Yeah, yeah. But if you if you took the situation where you just measured all the qubits at one time, then they'd be stuck in a computational basis. Right. Yes. Yeah. So if we take the limit of uh, measurement rate p going to one, that yeah. means that you are literally doing that. You're measuring all the qubits at once yeah. every time. Yeah. Uh, that must recover the standard protocol. Yeah. So we have that reference point. In mind. Okay. Like, okay. We're kind of, okay. Yes. Sorry, much less sophisticated person over here. So the so. Is this similar or different than a quantum state tomography type thing? <laughs> great, great, no, that's a great question. So quantum state tomography is more, you tend to do more. You tend to get the actual density matrix to you know, good accuracy. And that works for a few other systems, but we know that it, it, it has exponential complexity. So we won't scale to beyond a few qubits. This is trying to do, to do less, but uh, in a way that, that scales better. So you're trying to learn only some properties. Hopefully, a large class of properties, but you want to be able to do it on many body systems. Yeah. And then whether it succeeds depends. Um, okay, so this is the protocol that I just showed, the standard one. 
I want to say textbook, if I need to do for that, but you know, textbook classical shadows. Um, and this is the kind of thing that these centers were faced with in this particular problem. But they have lots of analogy. So, so let's let's go to the standard one first. We have this kind of flow, it's kind of a semicircle diagram. But we first have four more time evolution in the real experiment. So in the lab, there's a state, there's a unit evolution, there's a measurement but over time. We can feed this measurement into a computer. So this second part is simulated, it's just a computer. And then we go backward in time. So we start from the final measurement, we you know, evolve it backward, and we get our guess for the state. We can do the same thing in the second scenario. I'm going to do some modifications, but it is the same. So we have our quantum state, we go forward in time in this hybrid evolution that has both unitary uh, pieces and measurements. And we don't, we don't have to look at the final state. Still, we feed these measurement outcomes to our simulation. And then we try to you know, go backward in time in our simulation. But not knowing anything about the final state, what we put there is a completely mixed state. It's like a flat prior. We just don't know what's there. We put a get images, and then we hold it backward, and we get our state. state. So now you can write down what the state is. And it's, it is given here in terms of this case of M, which is the matrix you know, uh, that, that, that comprises both the unitary pieces and the projectors on the particular string. And um, uh, you have to trace normalize it with a state, and this is your final guess for this classical snapshot. Okay. This figure by Wiesling from the paper by uh, you and collaborators that came out uh, simultaneously with ours, but uh, it has nice figures, so I'm borrowing from them. Um, okay, so this protocol has written features on an ensemble of quantum states that just come out of the math. They're not the real states that are there, but they come out of the math of the protocol. Which is given here. So it's an ensemble of states. I mean that it's a collection of states that each come with a probability. Okay. And uh, that's what we can hear. And this, this ensemble of states describes a monocle dynamics of a completely mixed state, which is one up here, going through a monitor circuit uh, with those methods. Okay. So even though the real, the real process is also grown, so a non state going through the, the measurements, here in this you know, fictitious ensemble that comes out of the math, get a completely state going through the process. Okay, this doesn't know about the state. Um, and this problem, as we saw at the beginning, can undergo a dynamical purification phase transition where this, uh, you know, this mixed single state can become pure or static depending on the rate of measurements. Okay. And we can quantify this by properties of this ensemble, for example, establish purity for those of you for experts, not so important, but there is an order parameter that comes out of this, which we can think of as an entropy density of this output state. So it's a number between zero and one that tells you how much entropy you have per qubit, for example. And the phase transition consists in going from zero entropy density, this, this phase of frequent measurements, to, upon crossing this threshold, uh, positive entropy density, that phase. And what we show in our work is that the phase transition corresponds to a, to a, to a phase transition in P's ability to learn about the state row. Okay, so this phase diagram, we have these two phases depending on the measurement uh, rate. This phase with frequent measurements has quote unquote efficient learning in the sense that it's equivalent to standard classical shadows, two kind of constants, you know, kind of order one factors. So it's as if we had access to the final state. Are you assuming you have a pure state row now for this argument? Um, because I would expect that you should end up with a state that has the same entropy in the limit of a large number of measurements. So, um, no, I don't think I'm assuming anything about the, the actual state row. I think that. Um, so, so, if the measurement rate goes to one. Yeah. You're saying the entropy goes to zero yeah. in this circuit, even when you start with a completely mixed state at the beginning? Yes. So this entropy I'm talking about is an entropy of this process, which is not the, 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 the real evolution that's happening in the system. Yeah. Uh, but it's this, this protocol that uh, you use for, for, for learning, right? And even if, you, if your measurement goes to one, if your entropy goes to zero, then it's, you, you recover exactly uh, classical shadows Right, and then the classical shadows would reflect the state that I started with. Yes. And if it were mixed, then it would have maximal entropy, it would have entropy zero. Your yes. plot has entropy zero. Yes, so this entropy is not the entropy of the state row, but it's the entropy of the ensemble of, uh, of trajectories that you use as part of the shadows. Okay. So uh, in the standard protocol, 
the example I'm thinking about is random Pauli states. Yeah. That is a you know space pointing X, Y, or Z. That ensemble has zero energy. Yeah. Okay. That's, that's, okay. What, that's okay. what that. Sorry for the confusion, but that's what the, okay. that's what that number represents. So yeah, even if your state row is completely mixed, the, the, the ensemble of Pauli random Pauli states has zero energy. Say the input state and there is a the yeah. measurement state yeah, yeah. that you sandwich with that yeah. that uh, output state is joined. Yeah. So yeah, sorry if you remember that's a good point. Uh, so on this side, we are about as good as the standard shadows. So it's you can think of this p goes to one p because you're measuring everything, and that is roughly what keeps happening as you, even as you lower row somewhat, uh, lower p somewhat. But that's a point to cross threshold, and this entropy density kicks in. Uh, and here things become exponentially less efficient from what you're learning. So the information that you get out per broader experiment gets suppressed by this factor into the minus n times this parameter, exactly density. And this is an exponential expression in system size. So as you make your many body system bigger and bigger, you very quickly essentially learn nothing, right? The system becomes very good at hiding information from, from you. Um, and now we can unpack the consequences of this on various more concrete tasks that one could ask about. Uh, a very natural thing to do is learning how the expectation values on the, on the, on the, on the state. So what is the expectation of uh, you know, sigma x tensor and tensor sigma y tensor, you know, some kind of string of target matrices. Right? This contains all one body, two body, you know, two body operators, but also complicated body operators. <laughs> uh, there's four realities, of course, you can, you can four options per side. Um, so those, what I'm showing here is numerics, exact numerics on smallish systems, something like qubits, uh, where we look at the number of experiments needed. So this quantity that we call sample complexity jar, that's just the number of experiments needed, to learn this whole uh, set of four group operators. So this is a big ensemble. I'm going to show only some averages. So I mean, do I mean, how might mean different kind of properties of this ensemble? And we can see a few things kind of at a glance. Uh, so first of all, the measurement space transition that is very well known by studied in this model happens about 16%, so here. That corresponds to an optimum internability, where this number of experiments needed, it's a meaningful community. Uh, this is essentially a sweet spot between two kind of bad things that can happen on two sides. So below threshold, we run into this exponential suppression that I was mentioning. So we see reflected here, all of these curves have an uptick value. So evidently, as, uh, as we lower you know, eight, um, that, that mirrors this entropy density. So I had a kind of coordinated plot that was actually motivated by the, the real curve, which is so a study and things like that. See that here. And then above threshold, uh, we see another thing, which is that these different means start to diverge. So the ensemble acquires much more of a spread, like typical and average start looking different, and that reflects locality. So on this side, we become now very sensitive to the local structure of these operators, so that few body operators are, are good, we can learn them efficiently, and large operators are very bad. So now there is a big spread that needs to reflect it there. Uh, so the, the measurement in the space transition is a sweet spot between these two problems, and then comes out of this. I guess yep. some of them not necessarily the worst in the whole quantum information uh, world. Uh, it's kind of crazy that you know you could start from some state, arbitrary state row. You're running this process where you do some measurements and some symmetry. And then you're saying that instead, actually, if I had all the information about these classical things about the state, then I could start with a completely mixed state. And actually recover and, and do the inverse operation on it and recover information. That, that somehow like, like you said, you know, you, you start with a flat prior. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But it's still kind of a little bit mind-boggling to me that uh, running the same dynamics on the flat prior or inverse dynamics on the flat prior is going to give you information about the initial state. Is it information about the initial state or information about the post measurement state that you get yeah. again? It's about the initial state. Okay. Yes, we really get out the expectation values on row. That's it. And it's information that has leaked through the measurement outcomes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I guess, I guess that yeah, 
somehow does. I mean, this kind of yeah. it, it seems very counterintuitive, yeah. but if you think about it, it's like idiomatically connected to kind of classical shadows. Uh -huh. you know, there is a right. little limit of it. Just, right, right. If you right. think of it that way, right. it's just like changing a parameter there. Yeah. Right. It is less uh, counterintuitive. Right. And and the minimum, this is a little bit more complex to explain yeah. because I mean, so far you've been saying it was like this is a transition where it's either zero, you can learn some amount or you learn basically nothing, but somehow, okay, there's a somehow finite minimum at the transition point. That's a bit more delicate and it has to do with, with how you learn, what you learn. And, and again, this e goes to one limit is well understood. This is the local power uh -huh. shadows. And there we know very well that there is a right. three to the K scaling of complexity right, for these right. things. And so right. the big ones are very bad, and small ones are very good. So it's, it's spread and you just qualitatively start to recover that behavior as soon as you cross the transition. Mm -hmm. That's kind of the, the Thanks. Do you have a question? I'll say it please. Okay, good. Uh, we're almost done. I don't know how to do on time, but then. Uh, um, okay. Slides. okay, so we have this interesting feature with locality here that, you know, maybe, maybe you know, wasn't so clear, but it, it, it's, it's okay. But what I'm going to do next is get rid of it, so it's fine. Just gonna maybe one six anymore. minutes plus question. Okay, yeah, yeah. So to get rid of that uh, structure with locality, you do the following thing. The first step of the evolution before we actually start making measurements, that is, that is purely unitary, and it's long enough. We are not going to specify too much. It's long enough so that all the information gets spread out in the system, and we lose all of the uh, notions of locality that about this initial state. Um, so that now we have, we don't have to worry about uh, whether uh, are local or not. They essentially are all the same footing at this point. And what we can then show very uh, easily analytically. In this, in this case, is that the sample complexity, the number of experiments needed for learning uh, any of these five variables goes like this. So it's capital B is now the space I mentioned to the end. It goes from um, a, a, a P independent value here, which is the interface I mentioned to the end. And then at the transition, it kicks, uh, you know, non it kind of switches into this behavior. The exponent grows, grows like that. So this behavior is familiar because now at the, those of you who work on this, because now uh, we're basically doing round three for shadows at the at this point, not on the shadows anymore. So we start on that baseline and then we do the same and then it works all of a sudden. Okay, so there is a shadow phase transition here that's flagged by this non IPCT. You see this is a critical exponent of like 1.3 or something like that. Uh, some non identical behavior, but still on both sides we have an exponential. So maybe not so, maybe not so strike properly. But if you look at learning many body depth, which is another very important observable, so the expectation of our unknown role on some known quantum known quantum state side that we can decide, um, often an important one to measure. Uh, now this has the same behavior, but it goes from sort of constant or sub-exponential to you know abruptly to the exponential scale with the to the end excess, which reflects that. Uh, you know, exponential suppression of the information per measurement. So, okay. so now we have a true transition from polynomial to exponential. So I can think of this efficient, efficient learning transition. And finally, very quickly, something we didn't talk about at all, but um, this idea of learnability from mid circuit measurements originally came out a couple of years ago in a different context, which is that of dynamics with asymmetry. So if you have a system that has a conserved charge, has a two one symmetry, um, now you can ask about learning the total value of the charge from measurements on the local density. So you have a system with particles and holes. You locally measure when you have a particle or a hole and the number is conserved. The question is how many times do you have to measure to correctly guess the total number of particles between plus or minus something, right? Uh, and this is a more kind of specialized problem that has many interesting features. Uh, there's a phase transition that depends on separate transition of the entangled phase transition by the so-called charge sharpening. At some different value of the charge. Um, but anyway, this is a rich problem, very interesting. But I just want to say that within that format, we sometimes use this kind of very think about very hard because the, the, the shadows learning of the charge operator is your phase transition in this case between two points, one of which is understand, and the other is suppressed a factor of one over n. Okay, that was the last thing I wanted to say. Uh, I guess this is the last thing I want to say, which is that. These quantities that we see, like depending on the values of the observables we think about, um, 
can be used as themselves as diagnostics of the space transition, this underlying measurement of the space transition, in the sense that if you look at the variance of our estimators, that is what tells us about how many measurements we have to make. If you collect uh, 100 samples and they're spread out over you know, plus or minus a billion, we know we have to make you know, one over one billion squared uh, repetitions to get within our error bars, right? <laughs> So uh, we can, from a small number of samples, we can guess what this variance is and whether it scales exponentially or polynomially, for instance. And this can serve as a as an order parameter for this measurement to space transition that can itself you know, help us get rid of this kind of problem of branching trajectories and help us to do this without uh, having to be for it very many times. So again, there is a catch, which is the classification, which could be hard. So this isn't a sort of a complete uh, yeah, cool. That's so very quick, but it's, it's a very, especially very useful um, consequence of this. But this is one conclude that for you, measurement to space transitions, classical shadows, and here we bring them together to so get this space, space transitions and learnability, which on the one hand give us this new, more kind of concrete and operational meaning measurement to space transitions, and on the other hand, they, they help us unify all of these different manifestations into the same kind of umbrella. Um, and I think in the future, there, there are many more. Things to do with general direction in terms of phases and personal behaviors in various uh, computational tasks, whether quantum or classical, uh, and potentially useful applications of these ideas, either for you know shadows and learning or potentially for classical simulations of quantum systems. That's, that's some kind of future future um, operations. I just want to thank uh, my collaborator on this, Ikemani, and uh, many other collaborators on, on, on other rated boards that were influential for this. Uh, of course, thank you for your attention. And, Good thing, any final questions? Actually, it's there. So, maybe, well, it's the thing I have for okay. question. So, uh, so that V that you had uh, in the response, so that's the full Hilbert space dimension exponential? Yeah, totally. Yeah. Can you not figure something out from just the purity of the subsystem? And would that make it much more accessible? Um, so I mean, if, if, if you specifically care about renewable density matrices, yeah, then you could do all these things, just like take the rest of the system, put it away, and then just this on the subsystem of interest. And yes, then D becomes the you know, dimension of subsystem of interest. So, so it doesn't have to be like you could actually diagnose the transition, not necessarily mean in terms of you know. Because right. complexity of two to the n, is, it's regardless of whether it's two to the n or two to the two n, it's a problem. No, but I, uh, okay, so that's a good point. That's important. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, this is not so to, to diagnose that the, the 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 number of you know repetitions needed for learning is two to the n or four to the n. It does not require that many samples. Uh -huh. If you collect a finite number, uh -huh. you will see whether the roughly have a variance of a million or or three. Okay, so some some statistical right. uh, st uh, statistics from, magic to get so the standard 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 you know, standard yeah, of the, yeah. of the of estimation the of the variance. So that's efficient. Okay. What's inefficient is that maybe you have to do a classical computation that is actually that's actually hard. Okay, that's I see. Right. I see. So so maybe okay. I see. So that's good. So if you have the power to decide if you want to do your measurements all at the end with perfect. Right. Uh, perfect measurements, or if you want to do them randomly during your circuit, I guess my natural assumption would be I want to do them at the end, and I want them all to give me as much information as possible. So I would be normally living in the right-hand side for most applications. Of course. Yes. But you said there are many applications where you can imagine this is useful. So where where would where would I really want to do this? Right, right. So, so, so in this case, you are totally right. This is a contrived, you know, we're just thinking of a phenomenon that happens, we're not Thinking of this as a useful thing, you would do intentionally. Why would you not measure the final state? You just do it, then you know maybe use it, maybe not. Right? So there's no reason not to do it. Yeah. Uh, and generally, that would give you better performance. This is, um, I think, the way that this can be useful is not so much the particular thing we study, which is generally always doing better at the far end anyway. So uh, it's more about figuring out um, ways to do measurements that are um, that are entangled in particular ways. For example. That could be optimized for learning different things. So there are a few more you know, intentional ways of doing it that, that, that work uh, quite well. Uh, so interpolating between Pauli shadows and Clifford shadows, for instance, with finite depth circuits or uh, you know, measurement bases that, that, that are not single qubit like Pauli, but 
not, not some of global, but the next few body. Mm -hmm. um, there are things that you can do, and I think that you know, at least this helps me think about that. I don't know if it is objectively useful, but it, it, it's um, uh, you know, generalizing the protocol a bit, you can have to think about these things. Question I think are there situations where such a measurement record is a side effect and then you can use that information kind of both to learn about the initial state? Um, so are there situations which the measurement record does as what? Oh no, that this um, information you gather, that yeah. these random measurements, yeah. they are just the side effect. You're doing another experiment actually, and uh -huh. you have this record and you think, ah, maybe I could try to get the I see. Um, that's interesting. I mean Talk much about that. I mean, the kind of natural cases where you do things are error correction, but then you're very kind of deliberate about what you're measuring and you use them. But can you, there are protocols where you make measurements just for, uh, for other purposes? Um, but you, yeah, yeah, maybe if you're resetting, you know, you're doing a reset, you're resetting an unsealing. You make a measurement, but then you typically discard it and, and reset it to, to zero, for instance. Maybe you can use it there to learn something. but uh, yeah, that's interesting. I haven't thought much about it. Yeah, I thought about it in like, the context of having an open system where you're maybe not, you are not able to prevent you set, like if you set up measuring the thing, and then you kind of have to salvage <laughs> comes out of it. <laughs> and then second question, um, does it, is the, like if I, I mean, the, the completely flat prior makes sense, but uh, is it that, like usually detrimental when I, uh, for example, start from completely pure state mm -hmm. in this protocol? Um, so, uh, it's, a, it's a good question. Right? So, here we said basically, you know, you're doing this thing and you know, you don't know anything, so you put in a black pipe, but that's not necessarily right. Maybe you do have the measurements. It, it could be that there is a better prior that, that you could use based on that. Um, I guess you're just here or that anyway. Um, you, in fact, that is sometimes the case. So, in the paper, we have a few. Now, we have a few uh, different protocols for shadows you could do based on this, um, depending on what you're optimizing for. Uh, for example, maximum fidelity in the state, uh, minimum least squares. There are two different things you can do. This one is kind of heuristically motivated. It's the one that makes the most sense kind of visually, but um, it's not unique. So when you have complete measurements, like in this case, all of these versions are the same. And they're all the same. It's this mm -hmm. But in this case, they are actually different. Protocols and I think they would correspond to actually placing that either partially or completely pure state up here that shows them in some way based on the patterns. Okay. So it can be better for some things. Okay. Yeah. So one of the things that I was sort of from your title expecting to hear from you is that so you use this approach to engineer some steady states and the quantum uh, systems. That stuff is that like so you use the measurements. Mm -hmm. Right, themselves to drive the system into some profoundly non equilibrium steady state where it stays and be very, so it's prepared that state by the past. And yet, you still have this, this kind of readout channel where you can learn something. Right. Is that, is that a direction that people are going with this? I mean, I think, you know? yes, I think it's a very interesting direction. It looks generally using measurements as potentially shortcuts for interesting, for example, topological states that you would normally take. A long time repair because you have to maybe cover the boundaries. Maybe there are shortcuts to do that in finite time with measurements. People are actively thinking about that. Uh, in this case, we don't have steady state. We never, we never do kind of like construction with this forever non equilibrium state bouncing around. But the ensemble can achieve, you know, a st steady statistical uh, distribution. So, so that's more what we are thinking about for this particular problem. But I think that what you say is that they are. An active and interesting question. Yeah. A question that uh, occurs how the pipeline to get to more variable with your four operators at the transition. Yeah. So I'm wondering, can you think of the probability as effectively circuit that of the unitary you're applying? Because at the peak of one, you're basically pressuring right away. Right? And then as you decrease the effectively you know, acting with more units before you do a complete row of measurements. So can you think of basically the PS effective tank yes. circuit? That is my thinking. So yeah. uh, you know, you, you know, you've been thinking about shallow shadows. I think my thinking is that on this side, we essentially have something equivalent to shallow shadows with variable depth that goes to zero over here. 
and, and you know, grow in some way and should, should diverge in some way in the transition, but not in the naive sense that it just, you get a completely, completely dense circuit because that could be uh, an unpaid for shadows. Here you get something a bit weird that we're trying to model with three tensor networks. Maybe that's the right way to do it, but it's this critical state that has this stop arithmetic entanglement and it's a bit different. But to work here, yes, I think of this as you know, very good test. It would be nice to quantify that actually. Yes. Yeah, I think uh, we should probably move to time. Thanks there again for.